the history of pro football, few teams were more dominant than the 1969 Vikings. They led the league in points scored and had more than 50 in a game three times. They allowed the fewest points, averaging less than 10 per game. They won 12 games in a row, longest winning streak in the NFL in 35 years. But they did not win it all. Their story begins when they first entered the league as an expansion franchise in 1961. We thought of ourselves kind of as pirates. We had been used to doing a little head hunting. We'd get in some physical altercations. Or as most commonly known, we'd get in some good fights. The fight that rocked the franchise was one between head coach Norm Van Brocklin and quarterback Fran Tarkenton. It was a tough mix. Tarkenton was a preacher's kid. Come on, Vets, let's go. And Van Brocklin talked like he was from the streets. All right, 22 more on, 22. Come on, Archie, get your ass off the field. Come on. He could put together a string of curse words that were funny to me. I mean, hysterical. But you can imagine with a preacher's kid, they just didn't have a real good relationship. The breaking point came in 1966. In a game televised in Tarkenton's home state of Georgia, Van Brocklin benched the future Hall of Fame quarterback. Of course, it had a, a great effect on Tarkenton. Uh, he just thought that was the biggest insult. Vikings lost and finished the year in last place. At the end of the season, Tarkenton asked to be traded and was dealt to the Giants. Van Brocklin resigned. The Vikings replaced Van Brocklin with a successful Canadian Football League coach, Bud Grant. <laughs> Grant began molding Van Brocklin's pirates into disciplined soldiers. He started getting the people to line up for the national anthem. We practiced that just like we practiced to play. I didn't like the way we stood and scratched and moved and chewed gum and spit and, and had helmets on the ground. We practiced standing, our toes on the line, helmet up under your arm, no scratching. And we thought, man, this guy's nuts. You know, he's really crazy. But he had, but there was method to his madness. After getting the players in line, Grant reassembled the team's personnel. We didn't have the quarterbacks I felt were qualified to get us going. I said, hey, there's a guy in Canada, won Grey Cups up in Vancouver, and beat us many times. So we went and got Joe Cap. In 1967, Joe Cap left the CFL and his off-season job at a food company. I sold more squirrel brand peanut butter than anybody in, <laughs> in the history of peanut butter. And so uh, uh, that's why they call me Nutty Joe. There may have been another reason. In his Viking debut, Cap entered trailing 32 to nothing against Deacon Jones and the Rams. And so I go in there, I gotta do something different. So we get to the line of scrimmage and I said to Deacon, F you! <laughs> his game echoed his personality. Don't be calling me no uh, cookie. He was ill-mannered and unpredictable, but above all else, he was tough. I could have been nice, but I, I don't think I played nice. I don't, I don't like to be nice in the middle of a, of a contest. Nothing about Cap was nice, not even his throws. I did not use the laces. 
I did not use the laces, and that's probably unique. He threw some passes that they looked like ducks, but they got in the hands of the receivers. If that's what they're seeing, I mean, I, I can question their vision or their judgment on what's a, a, a spiral. I think over the years... Those who questioned uh, Cap did so at their own peril. The best national... First of all, I don't like any of this. I don't like any of this discussions about these quarterbacks. How the do I talk about that? Damn, you're asking me to make these all-time statements for, for 30 million people, uh, and I'm going on record here, you know, and, and you could spend an hour on each question. We needed somebody to kind of get this team off the mark, and Joe was that kind of a guy. Could he throw the ball with spirals? Can he throw it long enough, accurate enough? I hadn't measured all those things. All I knew was he was a winner. The nicest thing he ever said about me was, Joe Kappel never stopped looking for a way to win the game. Uh, that's what I got from it. On the other hand, uh, the only thing he ever said to me personally up close was uh, three words, get a haircut. <laughs> Grant's cleanup of the Vikings was quick and dramatic. In just three seasons, they became one of the least penalized teams in the league and the most dominant in all of football. But they would finish one win short of becoming Super Bowl IV champions. The 60s may have been a time for racial unrest in America, but on the Vikings, the only color that mattered was purple. Their Mexican-American quarterback was one of the team's most popular players. He just got along well with everybody. I, I don't know whether it had anything to do with him being a Mex Mexican-American. I mean, I didn't think of him as a Mexican until he always ordered tequila. In 1967, Cap had a chance to be the toast of Minnesota by completing a season sweep of the mighty Green Bay Packers. With the game tied and less than two minutes to play, Cap began driving the Vikings to the winning score. I made my pivot to hand the ball off to Billy Brown, and uh, my mistake, uh, I fumbled the ball. The Packers recovered, won the game, and Cap was inconsolable. At the post-game gathering, Cap recounted the loss with number 59, linebacker Lonnie Warwick. We got in a discussion as to who lost the game. He said the defense. I said, no, I did. Here, here's two guys saying, I lost the game. No, I lost the game. You know, I did this, and I really messed up. And the other guy says, ah, oh, yeah, but I did this, and I really messed up. And the next thing you know, they had taken it outside. Cap refused to back down and exchanged punches with Warwick, one of the Vikings' fiercest hitters. My effort was to show him that uh, the offense was just as tough as our own defense, and uh, uh, that was the stupid reason for the fight. Next morning, I get a call. <laughs> On the other end was Warwick. He says, Joe, how you feeling? I said, well, my left eye's closed. And <laughs> he says, we better go tell Coach Grant that, uh, you know, there's no problem, no dissensions. Well, I'll, be, I'll be there to get you. And that's what tequila can do to you once in a while. So uh, that was over and done with. I mean, we talked about it, and, uh, you know, I wanted to downplay it. And, and of course, the next day, every, they were buddies. They were, they were kissing cousins from then on. After finishing 1967 with just three wins, solidarity became the team's battle cry. In 1968, they won their first division title. In 1969, they adopted a new slogan, 40 for 60. 40 players committed to 60 minutes of football. Cap was injured for the season opener. Still, he was determined to show his devotion to the cause. I stood on the sideline and rooted for him. And I'm part of this team, and it's a team goal that we're doing. That's 40 for 60. Cap's replacement, Gary Quazzo, threw two touchdowns. But victory hinged on whether the Vikings could contain the Giants quarterback, former teammate Fran Tarkenton. We had talked a little stuff before the game, you know, a little smack. 
and uh, you know, told him we're gonna kick your ass. You know, you never wanted to let Fran, you know, get the upper hand because he had this little laugh. He would tee -hee you to death. <laughs> Vikings defense silenced Tarkenton for most of the game. But with Minnesota ahead by 13 with five minutes to play, the front four began to tire, and Tarkenton took advantage. He started scrambling, and he was wearing us out. With the lead down to six, Tarkenton faced third and 17 with just over a minute to go. Tarkenton, he's back to throw, scrambles around. Probable completion led to the game-winning touchdown. And the end of Gary Quazzo's reign as the Vikings starting quarterback. Gary had a tremendous game against the Giants, uh, but, we, but we lost. And I felt he, he had done nothing to lose the starting job. So on the Wednesday, uh, uh, Bud says uh, that I'm going to start. And I started to say, but he walked away. The intention all along was that, uh, you know, Cap was going to be our quarterback. I know Joe's mentality. Joe responds to challenges. He's ready for Baltimore, believe me. Baltimore Colts, the Vikings' week two opponent, were the defending NFL champion. In the 1968 playoffs, they eliminated the Vikings by attacking Cap. They did a very dangerous nine-man kind of a blitz. And we didn't catch up with it. They had beat him up. He was out for revenge. I looked at that film all off season. So when they came to us in the 69 season to play up at Met Stadium, that same blitz didn't work for him that day. Midway through the third quarter, Cap had already thrown five touchdowns. I left the game twice. Gary went in, but they knocked him out. They broke his nose. So I go back in and they're still blitzing, so we throw a couple more. Against one of the best defenses in football, Cap threw seven touchdowns. No quarterback has thrown seven in a game since. There's seven touchdown passes that day we did that, and uh, at least five of them are spirals. <laughs> Time for kicker, punters. Bud Grant was a rarity in coaching circles. He believed in few words and short practices. 9.30 bus. That's it. If I've got a, a wife and six kids, huh? sit up here with that. I got a family to feed. The way to, to make a living is basically what it was. Grant was able to detach himself from football, but not from his players, one in particular. A lot of people ask, who is your best football player? Well, as a coach, you can't, you can't go there. So how do I describe Jim Marshall? He's a special football player, a special man. And if it wasn't for Jim Marshall, I wouldn't be here today. I love Jim Marshall. Marshall, number 70, personified the Bud Grant standard. He always played smart. He always played hard. But most impressively, he always played. He had that great capacity of bouncing back from serious uh, bruises and contusions and play. Not only play, play is easy, but play at the level that he sets for himself, I think was, was the most amazing part of it. You know, there were times when I was legitimately sick uh, in the hospital. 
And um, but I, I don't know what it was when when they when they got to be game time. Um, there was just something there. It don't break my neck, Jim. I think you're ready. <laughs> When God was making defensive ends, they made Jim Marshall. And then everything else followed, okay? When you change coaches, you got different personalities and different, not necessarily rule, but mode of operation. And the thing that Jim Marshall, he bought it. He bought what I was saying, and I could see it in his eyes. And so right away, everything went through Jim Marshall. You ready? See, I got you again. If Meredith finds out that he can get us, then uh, he's going to run us and run us to death on that quick count. We can't afford to have that. If there was a player that would rah-rah and uh, go jump and dis show disrespect to the other team, Jim Marshall would have had him by the collar. Come on, Lonnie. Hey, 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 hey. Don't start. Look, man, play on the field. Come on, let's have a nice clean one, okay? Come on, we don't want to have a fight and stuff, man. Looking. Ironically, the Viking that tried to get everyone to do right made one of the biggest mistakes in NFL history. For the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way. And he's running it into the end zone the wrong way. Thinks he scored a touchdown. He has scored a safety. His teammates were running along the far side of the field, Russ, trying to tell him to go back. Go back. <laughs> he paid no attention. I played well the rest of the game. Uh, cause a fumble that we scored the winning touchdown on. So you can actually say I traded two points for, for seven points. But people, you know, constantly talk about the wrong way run. You know, I, I always tell them, you know what, think about the worst mistake that you've ever made and think about 100, 200 million people seeing you make that mistake and teasing you about it every day of your life. How would you feel about it? Off the field, Marshall sought individual glory. As a Viking, he was part of a foursome. Number 81, Carl Eller. Number 77, Gary Larson. And number 88, Alan Page joined Marshall on the defensive front. The foursome became known as the Purple People Eaters after the popular song by Sheb Woolley. One eyed, one horned, flying purple people eater was an ugly looking half bird, half dinosaur looking thing. And as you could think of a hundred other names we'd be happier with than the Purple People Eaters. In 1969, all four members of the Purple People Eaters made the Pro Bowl. Two. Eller and Page would make the Hall of Fame. Page manned the middle. He was uh, a little, little different than the rest of the guys. He didn't drink. He was very intent on getting his law degree. During football season, he would do a lot of studying. However, he was a very, very dedicated teammate and probably one of the best defensive lineman that I've ever seen. If Page was the brain and Marshall was the heart, number 81 Carl Eller, nicknamed Moose, provided the attitude. This is our thing, man. This is our thing. Get it in here, girl. Look here, I ain't lying, baby. Let's, have Let's win this today. Let's win this today. Let's go. In week three, the Purple People Eaters and the rest of the defense came within five seconds of the franchise's first shutout. The next week, they blanked the Bears. Lopsided wins became the norm. After their ninth straight win, a championship season looked inevitable. And the Viking players began to see themselves as invincible.
they score a touchdown, we start laughing. Why are you laughing at us? We have scored a touchdown. Yeah, but you're not going to win the game. <laughs> we are. In the NFL's Central Division, the final stretch of the season meant games in bad weather. I uh, was told that, uh, oh, Joe Kapp will do real well in Minnesota because he's been to Canada. <laughs> but you never get used to it. And that's one of Bud Grant's uh, coaching points, that uh, uh, you, nobody can ever get used to it. You just have to mentally get yourself prepared. He had stories that he would tell us. One of them was a story that he told us about building the Alaskan pipeline. We were behind schedule because it was too cold. We'd put people on a bulldozer, they'd drive the bulldozer, pretty soon they got to get down and get a cup of coffee and get warmed up, get more clothes on, go back out. Of the... We were way behind. And finally the Eskimos were up there. They learned how to ride the bulldozer and they put them up there. Well, they sat there all day. Obviously the Eskimo has some advantage. They tested the skin on the Eskimos and they tested, you know, metabolism and everything else. And and they came to the conclusion that there was absolutely no difference. The only, the only difference was that the Eskimos, when they went out and sat on the bulldozers, they expected to be cold, but they knew they had a job to do. Well, we're going to be cold, but we can still play football. So <laughs> he convinced us, <laughs> and we bought a ticket to that story. <laughs> Grant banned heaters from the Minnesota sideline. With only the thought of victory keeping them warm, the Vikings met the Lions in week 11. This game was Thanksgiving, and it was snowing, raining. They didn't take care of the field very well. Despite the conditions, Jim Marshall and Alan Page combined for one of the year's remarkable plays. The Vikings added another shutout and improved to 10 and one. The thing that you prove is, of course, that you can play when it's cold. That's been proven many times in the NFL, and you can play when it's cold. So that's what we wanted to emphasize. At the Vikings Metropolitan Stadium, both teams shared the same sideline, and crafty veterans knew how to get around Grant's heater ban. Your opponents would be sitting about 20 feet away from you, and they had great big heaters and stuff blowing all over. So you always made it a point when you came off on the sidelines, you'd always run down past their, <laughs> past their bench <laughs> and you could get a little warmth, you know, as you, ran, as you ran past. Despite the occasional cheat, the ability to withstand the cold became a matter of pride among the Viking players. You watch the Vikings come on the field, we don't have sleeves. <laughs> ah, nice day! And I remember Bill Brown walking down in front of the other team, scratching the, the scabs off his arm, letting it start to bleed before the game in the cold weather. Just a, you know, a little psychological thing that they got involved in, they bought it, but they did it more than I did. I just said, you know, left it up to them and they parlayed it into an advantage for us. And yes, I think it was an advantage, and, uh, uh, but not much, you know, point and a half maybe. <laughs> The Vikings parlayed the makeup of Metropolitan Stadium and the 20-foot Viking statue that stood in the end zone into another psychological advantage. And the sun would drop over the back of the stadium. Wind would come up. The temperature would drop 10, 15, sometimes 20 degrees. We would, under our breath, start saying, Odin, 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 Viking God of War. All of a sudden, the wind would come. Odin, Odin. This chill would come through. You see your opponents going, what manner of men are these? You know, these, these dudes are crazy. <laughs> they thought we had some kind of a spiritual thing going on. <laughs> and it was simply that it was going to get cold. <laughs> In week 13, the Vikings played the snowiest game in Minnesota history. Oh, he's got it! He's got it! The conditions did little to cool Joe Capp's fiery spirit. Wait a minute! Down seven to three, Capp lobbied Grant to let him throw. Whose ball are we playing with? Let's go now, that's our ball! And Joe uh, kept saying, well, when are we gonna open up, coach? I, I really 
we feel that we can get right up there and I can just 34, 35 punch at them. Field conditions don't aren't that conducive to that kind of a game. And I'd say, Joe, as long as the game is this tight and it was close, uh, we'll just do what we're doing. Need something, maybe something with a stop. Or a check. I'm taking flats yeah. and uh, wild bleak bootleg. Uh, flat is tough too. He was a real ally on the sideline, even though you knew he was Mr. Conservative. It's an 81 divide or something that basically played us so we can 61 three stop. Something to... If I had truly listened to him, I, I probably wouldn't have made it in the NFL because uh, I had to get more offense going. I had to uh, take control of the uh, signal calling where I did it my way. Oh, the man hold you back. I know, the man hold the horse back. Finally, uh, along the fourth quarter, we're behind, and I said, okay, Joe, well, we're going to open up now. I got Gene Washington. I said, Gene, we're going to split the zone. Now, how do you want the ball? You want the laces up or on the side, or where do you want the laces? Boom. <laughs> The win was the Vikings' 12th straight. For the playoffs, the Vikings would enjoy home field and all the advantages that come with it. The Vikings finished the regular season 12 and 2. At the annual awards banquet, Joe Cap was named the team's most valuable player. Here I am at the banquet knowing that the reason for our success is every department, every, every uh, player contributed to this thing. I know for a fact that there is no most valuable Viking. There are only 40 most valuable Vikings. This team has earned this thing together and thank you for, you know, saying so, but I don't want it. 40 for 60, put it that way. I, I, I just can't accept this. Thank you. It was spontaneous. I just couldn't accept it. The credo of 40 for 60 is more valuable to me. I thought it was a great gesture on his part. And Joe always had good timing. I mean, he, these things look spontaneous, but Joe's a, he's a thinker, and, and he, he, this, this was something that wasn't spontaneous. This he's something he'd planned. Find the hole! Find the hole! Joe! Win, Smitty, win! 40 for 60. 40 players committed to 60 minutes of football. Best described the effort the team would need to beat George Allen's Rams in the playoffs. In the opening moments, Carl Eller returned an interception for a touchdown, but the play was called back because of an offsides call on Allen Page. Allen was not offside. He was just very quick. It took a while for the Vikings to recover. Roman Gabriel threw two first half touchdowns. Joe Cap threw two second half interceptions. The Vikings trailed 20 to 14 in the fourth quarter, and their championship run was in jeopardy. On occasion, if I didn't see the, the defensive end uh, protecting for the bootleg, uh, I'd keep the ball. Purple People Eaters now had to protect a one-point lead. Their best pass rusher was matched up against the Rams' Hall of Fame tackle, number 76, Bob Brown. Carl met the challenge of the best offensive tackles in the league. The better player he played against, the better he played. The player they call Moose bowled over Brown and sacked Gabriel for a safety. final minute, the Rams made one last charge. Alan Page's penalty cost the Vikings early. With the game on the line, he was determined to make amends. He was a little angry, 
They, they were calling him for offside. Uh, they were holding him. They just invoked anger in him. And one thing you didn't want to do is make him angry. Cleveland Browns and sub-zero temperatures stood between the Vikings and a spot in Super Bowl IV. Neither were any match for the resolve of Joe Cap. We're on the five-yard line, and it's icy field. We called Bill Brown over the middle. Uh, we misconnected. I just don't go down. I'm going to go make the score. Slips the tackle. Later in the game, I called a, a short pass, and it was covered. I looked on this side, it was covered. So what do you do? So I'm running uh, down the field. If I had any kind of speed at all, I would have gone all the way. But then there's this uh, obstacle. <laughs> uh, his name is Jim Houston. And I put all my moves on him, both of them. He ran right through him. Houston went down and was out cold. Joe got up and Houston laid face down on the field. I'm sure to his embarrassment to this day, because he was certainly their best linebacker, maybe even their best defensive player. But Grant has led the Minnesota Vikings to the championship of the National Football League 27-7. to And it's nothing but pandemonium here at Metropolitan Stadium. It was a little hazardous trying to get off the field. It was like a massive crowd running at you, and you had to try to get between the people and, and get off the field. We didn't have security we got now. Now they throw you in jail if you get on the field. In those days, everybody in the whole stands wanted to be on the field. Toward the goalpost down and that type of thing. Some guys just stopped. You know, they just stood there, and people just jumped on them. There was something to, uh, to feel, and, and when it feels that good, you just want to treasure that feeling and, and keep it with you and hope that you remember it when you get my age. Where's the juice? Oh, yeah! Oh, look out! <laughs> we, we stuck with it. Oh, uh, yeah! You know, you know, oh, you know, yeah! You know, started the end of the game, we went to our running game. We wanted oh, to run yeah, the clock out, and we, game, we huh? stayed with it. Had a little juice. <laughs> I don't think yeah, 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 yeah. Get the camera right soda pop. Hard red, you. Hard red. <laughs> I'm gonna throw it all, all over you. Don't throw any. I'm, let me talk to this man first. <laughs> any more questions? And so when you win that game and you know there's one more to go, uh, you start getting ready. You, you start getting ready emotionally. Uh, your mind uh, starts to think of uh, uh, what, what's the next one. Uh, do we have another fight? Okay, bring them on. Super Bowl IV was the last game before the AFL and NFL merged. It was supposed to be the final display of the NFL's dominance. The Vikings were expected to beat the Chiefs by two touchdowns. In the pregame ceremony, a Viking in a balloon lost his way and careened off course. In the first half, the same could be said of the team. At halftime, they trailed 16 to nothing. 
We never got our blocking straight in the Super Bowl. So that sounds like I'm blaming the offensive line. I don't think uh, our, we ever, as a coaching staff, and I don't know how Bud would react to this, but uh, I don't think we were quite as smart as we had to be as a play caller in that game. I did not go to the pass on first down. I can critique it to death. Well, we really didn't have a sophisticated passing attack. We're ahead in most of our games, and most of our games we didn't have to come back. We didn't have the passing sophistication or the talent to do that. Now, Joe took a tremendous beating in that game trying to do that, but he tried to do it himself, and uh, our passing game was not that good at that point. In spite of uh, us uh, being behind at the half, uh, nobody was saying anything special uh, in the way of a rah-rah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we did not make some corrections that we needed to make. And I know I got our offense together and I ripped them pretty good. We came out with a 70-yard drive and that was us. The Vikings cut the lead to nine. Watch a play-action pass, and make sure you keep him in that pocket. They could not get any closer. That ball looked like it had helium in it. You can't float those balls in our league. That's right. Well, he's got it. He got it. Yeah. The end was near, but Nutty Joe never went down without a fight. Drop back was, was not working, so I did a, 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 a play pass. I knew Aaron Brown was not going to get blocked unless they made some calls that, that we weren't making. But I call it anyway because I, we needed a change. Kansas City leading 23-7. And being chased by Buchanan. Now Brown, fumble. Minnesota picks it back up again. And Cap is hurt. Cap had dislocated his shoulder. He was finished. And so were the Vikings. Here I am with my chance to win the world championship, and I get knocked out. When you get your chance, you got to be ready. You got to be prepared. And we did not get it done. Somebody says, um, winning isn't everything, but losing sure is nothing. And uh, you lose something like that, man, there's a real nothing feeling. It's not one of your most memorable moments today, I guess, Coach. Uh, what happened? <laughs> you saw what happened. We played a fine football team, and I think Kansas City uh, are deserving winners, and certainly uh, you couldn't have a finer team represent uh, professional football as our, as our champion. You agonize after the game, and what did you, could you have done? What did you do? What you didn't do? You agonize, you replay it, you look at it, and then you put it aside. To a man, nobody cried. Nobody made excuses. Nobody blamed anybody. It was a team right to the end. Minnesota's loss in Super Bowl IV marked a stunning end to a remarkable season. But the Vikings were a team on the rise, and many expected their fall from grace to be short. But I know it's a great disappointment, but uh, we're going to hear a lot more about the Minnesota Vikings in the years to come, I think. Well, we sure, we sure hope so, and uh, maybe we can come back next year or sometime and uh, redeem ourselves a little bit. After losing Super Bowl IV, Joe Cap had a contract dispute and never played for the Vikings again. In 1970, he joined the Patriots for one forgettable season and was then out of football. His career and the team's legacy would have been different if they had won Super Bowl IV. 
I have uh, spent my life now uh, looking back and uh, make assessments of, of that question. And uh, I feel that if we'd have won the game, that uh, I could have played for the Vikings another season. And I think our team, the momentum that we had, we would have won another Super Bowl. In 1972, Fran Tarkenton came back to Minnesota. Vikings returned to three more Super Bowls. They lost each time. never gotten over it. None of them. Those were four opportunities that we had to prove that we were the, the best in the world, and we didn't do it. We got beat, and each one of the, the Super Bowls, we got beat soundly. And you never get over things like that. I mean, it still haunts me every day. You got to be able to live with losing. That's the hardest thing to get over it. I mean, you can't let it eat you up. I have never gone back and looked at those Super Bowl games. I don't have a copy of any of them. I mean, I don't. That's not. That's not my legacy. I mean, that's that's what we did, and that's over with. Um, no, it, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's not something I live with. <laughs> 